Hi, my name is Paul Sargent. Welcome once again to AP Euro Bit by Bit. Today, we're going to answer the question, what is absolutism? It's a concept which is fairly simple on the surface, but fairly complicated underneath, and one which my students tend to struggle with year after year. So, in a very pre brief period of time, I want to try and show you what absolutism really is. Let's get going. Okay, so one of the th main historical thinking skills that we have to understand in AP Euro is the idea of continuity and change over time. And we've talked in AP Euro bit by bit a little bit about the rule of the new monarchies who consolidated power to differing degrees in uh, different parts of Europe in uh, the uh, early part of the 15th, 16th, and uh, 17th centuries. Absolutism is kind of the next step in the process, where rulers in these countries who are successful at creating absolutist empires are going to take complete and utter control under one person, so that the monarch is the absolute authority in the state, answering only to God something that becomes known as divine right theory. So in terms of the theory of absolutism, there are really two guys that you really need to know about. Number one is a guy named Thomas Hobbes, who writing in England during the English Civil War, ends up writing a book called The Leviathan, a very, very influential book that you may read excerpts of in your class. His central idea is this. People who are left uncontrolled live in what was called a state of nature a long time ago. That state of nature, life was nasty, brutish, and short, as he put it. In other words, it wasn't very good. People were fighting all the time. There was no security in all of this. And so he said what people need is people need a strong, central ruler who can control them and control society. Now he's followed up by a guy named Bishop Bossuet. And Bishop Bossuet, as you may notice from his name, was a French guy who writes about the idea of the divine right of kings. And the idea behind the divine right of kings is that kings have only God to answer to. They don't answer to the people, they don't answer to the nobles, they don't answer to anybody. They answer to God. Bosuet's ideas could best be summed up in this excerpt. God is infinite. God is all. The prince, as prince, is not regarded as a private person. He is a public personage. All the state is in him. The will of all the people is included in his. As all perfection and all strength are united in God, so all the power of individuals is united in the person of the prince. What grandeur that a single man should embody so much. But let's just list a few major characteristics of absolute rulers. Number one, the belief that the sovereignty of a country is embodied in the person of the ruler itself. Rulers are not subject to national assemblies. Rulers are not subject to the will of the people. They have to bring the nobility completely under control so that the nobility doesn't have any say in politics and is really subservient to the ruler themselves. In the 17th century, one of the ways to do this was to take away the nobles' power to administrate and give that to bureaucrats hired by the king, loyal to the king, to carry out things that nobles used to do. In fact, even to make this more powerful, some monarchs even gave titles of nobility to bureaucrats who carried out the loyalty and, and really did whatever the king wanted them to do. Gaining more control of the church and the appointment of officials inside of a country made the monarch even more absolute and allowed the message of the church to back up the message of the monarch. We also see the growth of large standing armies, which create security in a state and show the power of the absolute monarch to wage war against uh, his political enemies. And finally, some monarchs employ secret police to go and infiltrate the population and find out who's actually subverting the monarchy and dispensing with them. So that's what absolute monarchs actually go about doing. And what you'll find is there are varying degrees of success from arguably the most successful absolute monarch of the period, Louis XIV in France, all the way down to very unsuccessful monarchs. 
Generally speaking, absolutism is more successful in the west of Europe and less successful in Central and Eastern Europe. In Central and Eastern Europe, they find it much harder to lower the power of the nobility because they can't consolidate the power at the center as efficiently. And at the absolute least successful part of absolutism, you have the Dutch Republic and you have the English constitutional monarchy that comes out of the English Civil War. These represent a failure of absolutism and they represent alternative ways to govern a country. Well, because while no one on the continent was as successful as Louis XIV in consolidating power, and I'm going to talk about that guy because he was fantastic. But while no one was as good as him, everyone tried to mimic him. So, just to recap, absolutist rulers are people who seek to dominate their states. They take the idea that their divine right to rule has been given to them by God and that they can then rule without any responsibility to nobility, to elected representative bodies, or to the people themselves, that it all comes from the person of the ruler who represents the state. They use lots of tactics to do this. They subvert the nobility, they take over religion, employ secret police, have large standing armies, employ bureaucrats to do the jobs of nobilities, and through it all, they try and consolidate power into a very strong and very centralized European state. So that's absolutism. And I'll be making more videos, so please be sure to subscribe and you'll be notified whenever I have some more. Till then, my name's Paul Sargent. Thanks for watching.